So in this video we're going to talk about the how enzymes change the energetics of chemical reactions. We've already talked a little bit in my first video about how ATP changes the energetics of chemical reactions and we want to see the same thing for enzymes and again I really want you to see how they're different. Cells need both of these tools in order to make sure that the chemistry that needs to occur can occur. So let's just review ATP very briefly and then I'll go to enzymes. Um, ATP we said can help turn an endergonic reaction exergonic by phosphorylating the, the chemical reactants. So um, when chemical reactants are phosphorylated, that greatly increases their energy level. So I want you to imagine that this is sort of like the reactants with a phosphate attached. Um, and then ATP loses a phosphate and becomes ADP. And when um, the, the reactants are then phosphorylated, the, the whole um, energy profile changes. Um, the products largely uh, stay the exact same as they were. And this sort of now becomes the new delta G. And the new delta G is negative um, versus the old delta G uh, products minus reactants was very positive. So we have converted um, a formerly endergonic process into an exergonic process. So now we're going to assume that the, the chemical reaction is exergonic. Either ATP phosphorylated the reactants and made them exergonic, or perhaps the reaction was exergonic to begin with. And so the other factor that might be uh, a problem for cells is if the reaction just occurs too slowly to be useful for the cell. And what really governs speed is a factor called the activation energy. Or um, re really what activation energy is, is it's the difference between the energy level of the transition state and the um, initial reactants. So this kind of quantity here represents activation energy. Remember that um, the difference between the products and the reactants was delta G. So make sure you see that, that activation energy and delta G, the change in free energy, are quite different concepts. And so the idea here is that the, the higher the activation energy, the higher the hill, as it were, the slower the reaction is going to be. Um, you can imagine that individual particles are going to need sort of this enough energy to get over this hill and then they can release a tremendous amount of energy when they become the actual product. Um, what makes the transition state high in energy to begin with? Um, I just want you to imagine that the transition state represents this time when old bonds are breaking and new bonds are forming. Remember that chemical bonds are very stabilizing for the atoms um, that, that have that chemical bond. And so this sort of transition state where old bonds are breaking and new bonds haven't quite formed yet are, are incredibly um, unstable. And that's what makes the transition state so high. So um, what can be done about that in cells? Let's just give a kind of example chemical reaction. Um, the chemical breakdown of hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen is uh, very slow because um, of reasons that we're not really going to go into. Um, some chemicals will have higher transition states than others. Um, but that's why if you put hydrogen peroxide in a dark bottle and just put it at room temperature in your house, um, it might not fully react for years. Um, you still have an expiration date on there. It's still an exergonic overall process. Uh, but the reaction is very slow because the hill is very high. And yet, when you pour hydrogen peroxide on, say, a cut, um, and you see those bubbles of oxygen gas almost immediately, um, that is because we have an enzyme. And what we're going to see that enzymes do is they lower the hill. Um, and they lower that hill effectively by lowering the transition state. Um, by stabilizing the transition state, let's say this is the new transition state with, with an enzyme-catalyzed reaction, um, the new reaction pathway would look something like this. So notice that the um, um, reactants and products energy level stays the same. Enzymes do not affect the reactants, do not affect the products. They simply change the transition state in between by stabilizing it or lowering its energy. Um, this might be the old activation energy right here. And then the new activation energy is considerably lower. And the idea is with such a lowered activation energy, maybe most of the molecules at the cell's temperature are able to get over that very small hill. And so the reaction occurs much, much, much faster. Please notice uh, my note down here, enzymes are not changing delta G. If the uh, transition state is lowered, that still does not affect the difference between the overall reactants and the overall products. In other words, 
enzymes cannot make an endergonic process faster. Um, um, the reaction has to be exergonic first. Um, enzymes cannot affect delta G. That's what ATP does. Um, the enzymes can only make the reaction faster. Um, enzymes are not all are, are also not adding energy to the chemical reaction. They are simply lowering the requisite energy for the reaction to occur. So don't tell me that enzymes like like heat up or, or otherwise add energy to the chemical reaction. That is also not true. Um, and so the other concept we just want you to appreciate about, about enzymes is that oftentimes uh, real metabolic pathways inside of cells involve multiple enzymes working together. So I just want you to imagine that maybe this is a sample pathway. Maybe we're trying to take an initial chemical A and turn it into chemical P. Um, and each one of these conversions might involve a different enzyme. So this is just sort of a, a very simple cartoon, pretending that five enzymes are necessary to create the different um, chemical reactions needed to convert A ultimately into P. And so what I want you to realize is that enzymes are not always active inside of cells. Um, sometimes enzymes might also need ATP help to make their chemical reaction happen. And we, as, and cells don't want to spend ATP energy um, helping chemical reactions occur that um, aren't really needed by the cell. And so the idea is that sometimes enzymes might be inhibited in order to, to stop them from acting. And what I really want you to appreciate is that the, the idea is that many metabolic pathways are inhibited by the final product itself. Um, that final product serves as the inhibitor that might go back to a really early enzyme in the process, maybe even the first enzyme in the process, and effectively turn it off so that more of A is not turned into B. And so um, you remember that uh, from our discussions in a past unit that there are many different ways that an inhibitor might block an enzyme. Maybe it blocks the active site of the enzyme directly so that it, it sort of directly competes with the substrate in order to um, bind to the active site. Um, other inhibitors might um, bind instead at an allosteric site. Um, they're not directly binding at the active site, but by binding at the allosteric site, they change the shape of the active site so that the substrate still cannot interact with the enzyme, and we call that non-competitive inhibition. And um, whichever way it happens, what I want you to realize is that the, the end product is often a weak um, inhibitor. In other words, it sort of binds, but it can also pretty easily fall off. And so what I really want you to think about is maybe within a cell, there's sort of a population of a certain enzyme. So I want you to imagine that the enzyme is here in blue. Maybe it works with the substrate that is in yellow here, the yellow circles, and that uh, maybe this is a multi-step process, um, so there are other enzymes um, involved as well. But I'm also just showing the red triangles. Maybe that represents the end product at the, at the end of a series of chemical reactions. And that r end product red triangle can bind non-competitively to this blue enzyme and inhibit it. And what I just want you to realize is that it's not just a case of like one enzyme being on or off. What it really can do with a population of enzymes, if each inhibitor sort of weakly binds and falls off, what I want you to realize is that overall enzyme activity is really more like a dimmer switch. If there's very few end product molecules around like are shown here, then it would be very unlikely that they would be inhibiting an enzyme at any point in time. And so you might say overall enzyme activity is very high. But as the end product continues to build up, maybe it's more likely that the inhibitor is bound to an enzyme at any particular time. And so we could say maybe enzyme activity is very low at this point. And if the cell is just saturated with end product, maybe the odds that, that almost every enzyme is bound to an inhibitor are high. Maybe enzyme activity is practically zero at this point. But if that end product maybe is used at some other point for some other chemical reaction within the cell, which is very common, um, then perhaps these red triangles would go away and uh, be cleared out, and then they would fall off as the inhibitor of these enzymes, and enzyme activity would immediately pick back up again. So I hope you can kind of appreciate the beauty of that system. The enzymes are active when there isn't very much of the product that they produce. So um, what we've covered here in this video is just this idea of, of the, uh, 
the, the sense that ATP and enzymes are both needed in order to help chemical reactions occur in cells. We talked about what enzymes did energetically. They lower what's called the activation energy. They do not change delta G. And then we kind of talked about this idea of the regulation of enzyme activity or the, the regulation of an overall metabolic pathway that involves several enzymes because often the concentration of the final product itself will um, determine how inhibited those enzymes are and thus how, how active they are in speeding up the chemical reactions.